I want to give a background before I show these videos because I'm going to show them uninterrupted. These videos, I think in total, will probably be about uh, seven or eight minutes. Uh, I will talk about each one after. Um, in, uh, so I will talk about after this first one. I will jump to that. But um, this is very... We're, we're talking about um, Chairman Fred Hampton of the Black Panther Party of Chicago. I find it very, very important to highlight certain aspects of this story before we jump into what he was talking about. And um, that is that Fred Hampton in these videos, I believe, is 20 or 21 years old. And if you've listened to previous iterations of, of you know, my show, I think I did it in February of 2020. Maybe 2021. I talked about the three leaders, um, specifically MLK, Malcolm X, and uh, Fred Hampton. But for those who don't know, have not heard me go over this and have not, I've never done clips like this before on here. Not barely any clips like this before, historical clips that are important to the context of what we're talking about. But I think um, listening to uninterrupted, unclipped like like full fledged here's like a 5 minute speech contextualizes much more than like one quote will and it's somebody like Fred Hampton who has been overlooked i would say in history as a revolutionary leader, and I don't mean revolution like we're going to storm the capital or revolution. I mean like in a political revolution sense. And that's, see, that's, ah, this is where this rhetoric over time has been co-opted and coerced and manipulated into this weird coagulation of right-wing spewing nonsense. But Fred Hampton in Chicago started the Black Panther Breakfast Program, which provided free breakfast to kids throughout Chicago, and it would provide educational opportunities and babysitting opportunities and all this stuff, and it provided a sense of community to people that didn't otherwise have it. It wasn't necessarily a religious organization. Again, why this secular, intersectional, um, it, provi it provided opportunities for women. Uh, and again, I, I will state that with the asterisk of it was the 1960s. So, of course, it's not exactly to the standards of uh, equality that we would hold it to today. And of course, the Black Panther Party of today is different than the Black Panther Party of then. This is the type of nuance we need to bring to these stories and these um, historical figures and noting that, like, Things change, labels change, ideologies change. But Fred Hampton was somebody that the FBI and the government found so, da so dangerous. And I don't mean dangerous as in like a violent criminal. They found his words and his ideology and his inspiration to others so dangerous that they killed him in his sleep. And I'm not exaggerating. I am not hyperbolic. While I show you this clip, I will bring you the book and I will show you it. Fred Hampton's murder by the FBI was literally proven in the court of law in the United States. A functional lynching at the age of 21 years old. Now, I, I can't, I will give you the full story after we listen to this stuff, but these are important things to note. Um, I get chills listening to this. Uh, I'm just going to show you full screen. Uh, you don't need to see me and my reaction because I'm just going to let it run for a couple of minutes. So please um, 
questions, anything like that that you have, you can feel free to throw them in the chat or leave a comment if you're watching this post um, or just shoot me a DM. If you like this historical look at some of these figures, I would gladly go back and pull more clips of other figures as we move on. And we have these these um, episodes where it's less like craziness each week. So uh, with all that being said, here is Fred Hampton on revolution and racism. I'm the deputy chairman of the state of Illinois Black Panther Party, Fred Hampton. And uh, a lot of people don't understand the Black Panther Party's uh, relationship with white mother country radicals. A lot of people don't even understand that word that they're refusing a lot. But what we're saying is that there are white people in the mother country that are for the same type of thing that we are for stimulating revolution in the, in the mother country. And we said that we'll work with anybody and form coalition with anybody that has revolution on their mind. We're not a racist organization because we understand that racism is an excuse used for capitalism. And we know that racism is just is, is a byproduct of capitalism. Everything would be all right if everything was put back in the hands of the people. And we're going to have to put it back in the hands of the people. Everybody in the state of Illinois is going to have to be involved or even around the revolution because we're going to have one. We're going to have to, we're going to, have to do more than talk. We're going to have to do more than listen. We're going to even have to do more than learn. We're going to have to start practicing, and that's very hard. We've got to start learning, and you learn through practice. We've got to start making mistakes, and you learn through making mistakes. We've got to start getting out there with the people. And a lot of times we think we're better than the people, but that's an insult, and that's criminal. Thank you better than the people. We got to get together and learn where it's at. It's going to take a lot of hard work. Especially for children, it's something else. You ought to dig on it. All, every sister in this, in this, in this, in this, uh, in this audience. Now, every sister in this audience ought to get themselves together and come on down and help us that breakfast for children program. Y'all ought to help come down and help feed them children in the morning. We have breakfast for children. Because we teach the people through practice, through observation and participation, that people can be fair free. That's the people thing. Socialism is the people. You're afraid of yourself. If you're afraid of socialism, you're afraid of yourself. We know they have our pictures, we know they're looking for us, we know they want us, but we're still saying that even though we couldn't be in a fit, as far as this system goes, on the mountaintop, we in the Black Panther Party because of our dedication and understanding what's in the valley, knowing that the people in the valley, knowing that we originally came from the valley, knowing that our flag is the same flag as the people in the valley, knowing that our enemy is on the mountaintop, our friends are in the valley. We say even though it's nice to be on the mountaintop, we're going back to the valley. <laughs> I be in the office every day. I be in the streets propagandizing every day. I be working with everybody every day. I be teaching that solidarity is the thing. The end of a complete wipeout of imperialism is the thing. So if you're gonna be thinking about me, that's what Bobby would be teaching. If you're gonna be thinking about us, all we say is we don't. Ain't no thing about going nowhere, getting killed. All we wanna know is that you're doing what we'd be doing if we were here, and you got to do that. You can't do it unless you believe that you can do it. In the spirit of liberation, we understand that they want everybody in the party in jail. And we know that if we try to figure out and separate and divide who should go and who shouldn't go, more time, more time doing, that doing that than working for the people. For the so the quick solution, the, solution, the speedy, one, speedy one, nobody go. Nobody go. Nobody go. Nobody go. We all stay right here. With the people. Because we love the people. Okay, you can put your hands down now. We say all power to all people. We say white power to white people. White power to white people. Brown power to brown people. Brown power to brown. Yellow power to yellow people. Yellow power to yellow people. Black power to black people. Black power to black people. 
Ex power, the booze that we left out. We say Panther Power to the Vanguard Party. When you, when, when you leave here, leave here saying the last word, before you go to bed, next time I am a revolutionary, make that the last word. In case you don't wake up, then somebody might believe it and you might, you know, end up in a, what they call it, revolutionary happy hunting ground. <laughs> Say that. I am a revolutionary. I am a revolutionary. Say it when you're going out. Everybody want to keep it with me. Okay, we're going to say it while we're going out. And we're going to start a thing called Free Fred. Don't that sound nice? Hey, let's do that. Free Fred. Free Fred. Free Fred. Free Fred. Free Fred. Free Fred. Hey, I ain't even there yet. Oh, so that is clip number one. Um, cl- quick analysis of it before we go into number two. And again, uh, I don't know if people really like this stuff. I really find this um, very enlightening and 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 very important uh, to look at historically. Um, I I find it. Um, that if you don't wake up yeah so exactly like this this is the type of thing that is hard to is hard to like put into words right fred hampton knew that on some level he was risking his life putting his certain ideology out there um a lot of the stuff that happens around this time is around the time of uh, the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, this that that clip right there is right before uh, he goes. He's going to jail uh, on trumped up charges. And again, here's the book. I, I went and got it while I was playing the clip. Uh, the Assassination of Fred Hampton. This book is written by Jeffrey Haas. You can see the author right here. He was the lawyer that represented the Hampton estate, which again, the Hampton estate wasn't like an estate worth like millions of dollars. It was just his family. And um, important to note, and I think it might be in here, in uh, pictures here, is in the beginning here, you could see... Uh, Fred's family and Fred's mother, if you know your history, was the babysitter for Emmett Till. So when we talk about history, we're, Fred Hampton would be in his 70s if he was alive today. It, we, we're not talking about ancient history here. We're talking about somebody that has these these ideas that are, you heard him say it you know, white, black, brown, whatever. And X power to whoever we left out. That is the type of movement that is intersectional, is 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 groundbreaking in its utility in coordinating and uniting people. And that can be scary to some people, but it's very liberating and inspiring to me. And the comment that he says at the end, you might not wait, you, you, you know, you don't know that you're going to wake up tomorrow, but you go to bed saying, I am a revolutionary. And in another quote, it's not in the videos that I have today, but he says, I am a revolutionary. You can't kill the revolutionary or sorry, you can kill the revolutionary, but you cannot kill the revolution. And again, this is about movements, movement building, long term working class politics that will build us towards a brighter tomorrow. So. I will jump to this second clip here because this one is even this one might the, the the audio remember these are from the 60s so the audio of these is not great so I apologize from that but this is another clip while Fred is on trial and this is him giving a speech in the uh in the courtroom so let's take a look at this and he said already what he thought about people that had different uh, political beliefs than he had. His speeches sound somewhat like those of Hitler, and we know why he wants to see Fred Hampton put in jail. Why do I have a lot of arrests? Because of harassment. Why is that harassment? Because the people that harass me 
I set up a problem that made me disagree with them violently, and, and they, they set up this problem in order to exploit me and other people like me. And why they want to get rid of me because I'm saying something that might wake up some other exploited people and some other oppressed people, and if all these people ever get together, then these pigs that are exploiting us, we'll be able to run them into the lake. That's why they want to get rid of us. And it's just, uh, it's sort of like a primary thing with me. I'm the, I'm the first move that they'll make. I'm a part of an organization who will be the first organization they'll move on because I happen to be a part of an organization, the Black Panther Party, that is the only organization, in fact, that has came out and stood up loud and clear and said that we don't care what anybody says, whether they have guns or not and badges or 18 uniforms, if whenever they step outside the bounds of legality <coughs> into the bounds of illegality, then we'll blow their brains out if they're bothering the people. Right and what makes them mad about that? They're constantly bothering the people. Anybody that's out there for the protection of the people happens to be in direct conflict with them. What makes them mad about it? What makes them mad about it is that they have black people and white poor people and red poor people and Puerto Rican poor people and Latin American Puerto Rican people of uh, uh, poor people of all descents. They had them caught up in movements based on racism when the Black Panther Party stood up and said that we don't care what anybody says. We don't think to fight fire with fire best. We think you fight fire with water best. We're going to fight racism, not with racism, but we're going to fight with solidarity. We said we're not going to fight capitalism with black capitalism, but we're going to fight it with socialism. We stood up and said we're not going to fight reactionary pigs and reactionary state attorneys like this and reactionary state attorneys like Hanrahan with any other reactions on our part. We're going to fight their reactions with all of us people to get together and have an international proletarian revolution. Right on. Right on. Right on. Right on. And that's saying all power to the people. Right on. Right on. That's saying that no matter what color you are, there's only two classes. And that's saying that there's a class over here and there's a class over there. And the reason that this class over here has never did anything to get this class off its back because this is lower, this is upper, this is the oppressed, this is the oppressor, this is the exploited, this is the exploiter. And these people in this class have divided themselves. They say, I'm black and I hate white people. I'm white and I hate black people. I'm Latin American and I hate hillbillies. I'm hillbillies and I hate Indians. So we fight amongst each other. And you've you heard the testimony of pigs here and you got pigs of all colors, you know that. You got pigs that are white, you got pigs that are black, you even got pigs that are black and white. Propagating the same type of madness that uh, uh, this buffoon Henry had would be propagating if he were here himself. And why? Because they want to keep you to believing that I'm your enemy and that everybody else that's black and that wears a lot of hair on his head and hair on his face, they want to keep you thinking that he's your enemy. Why? Because if ever you would disregard him and overlook him just for a minute and throw away that question of racism and start to deal with a little logic, then it could be, there would be no one else you could attack other than Henry Hand, other than Daly, and other than Tricky Dicky Nixon. If you make the right decision, then the press people of the world will get complete satisfaction. I know you return to keep pretty good, not guilty. Thank you. So that was him on trial, Fred Hampton on trial, pleading his case against trumped up charges. And why do I say that they're trumped up charges? Because in this book, again, you can find it in this book right here or just Googling it or whatnot, but you can find it. And I, I, if you care about the history of, of, of civil rights in this country, you need to read this book. It, yes, at times is a little bit dry talking about a legal legalese and all that stuff, but it is illustrative of what actually happened to this man, to this movement when they took him out. They put him in, they put Fred Hampton in jail on trumped up charges. And this was all a part of a grander narrative and a grander program called COINTELPRO, Counterintelligence Program. This COINTELPRO, how do we know about it? How do you, Connor, oh, that sounds made up. You, you, you don't know about this. They run after radical groups in the 1960s and 1950s. Um, and of course, later on, went after some of the radical right wing groups to maybe make up for it. And then it was discontinued after the 70s, where the most radical and uh, 
frankly, and I don't mean radical in a bad way in talking about these um, black leaders. I'm talking about Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, Fred Hampton. All of them are dead by the year 1970 or 71. Uh, then the program is ended. So if you look at the FOIA information, Freedom of Information Act information regarding the FBI's COINTELPRO, you can find and I'm, that I am not making this up. I'll actually keep myself on screen here. You can find that this is not made up in any sense of the in the sense of the way, uh, because in the sense of the word, because COINTELPRO. The FBI began COINTELPRO, short for Counterintelligence Program, in 1956 to disrupt the activities of the Communist Party of the United States. In the 1960s, it was expanded to include a number of other domestic groups, such as the Ku Klux Klan, the Socialist Workers' Parties, and the Black Panther Party. All COINTELPRO operations were ended in 1971. Although limited in scope, about two-tenths of one percent of the FBI's workload over a 15-year period, COINTELPRO was later rightfully criticized by Congress and the American people for abridging First Amendment rights and for other reasons. And of course, those other reasons, oh, as I go to the wrong thing, those other reasons are this. Fred Hampton was assassinated in his bed when he, upon his return from jail. Fred Hampton had an FBI informant working with COINTELPRO, which was run by J. Edgar Hoover, the Attorney General of the United States at the time, under Richard Nixon, with the coordination of Hanrahan, which is the guy that he rep he talks about in that in that video, the District Attorney of Chicago, which in the movie Judas and the Black Messiah is never mentioned, which is the biggest criticism of that movie that I have. In this book. The whole prosecution is about prosecuting Hanrahan, the district attorney, who operated and executed the FBI raid of the Black Panther Party's house and the drugging and murder of Fred Hampton in his bed. At the age of 21, there is, an, there is a pretty accurate description of the raid in the movie Judas and the Black Messiah. So if you are looking for a simplified version of this story, a... Hollywood version of the story, a great movie, but not the full real story. Judas and the Black Messiah will do, but the actual portrayal of the FBI raid is pretty damn accurate. And I know this because the raid is extremely detailed in this book and it is analyzed through because there were lies. This is, this is important. There were lies about the Black Panthers shooting through the door first, proven through scientific evidence to be false. Shotguns from the outside from the police were blasted through the door. Drugs were put into the drink of Fred Hampton before he went to bed so that he was unconscious when he was shot in the head multiple times in his bed with his pregnant uh, girlfriend in the room with him. This is history that is not taught, that is absolutely necessary to understand the the default uh for some people in these communities in distrust for government maybe even jump jumping to saying the distrust for police because there are things like this have that have existed and this is why we have to build forward in both community building and intersectional working class politics and building the trust back with our institutions because that comes from both ends. That does not just mean that, oh, you know, we should all just trust the police. That is not the case. But the, the, the actual police have to build the community and work with the community that they work in. And in the chat, we have Malcolm X. Malcolm X has been proven that he was assassinated with the help of the FBI, which just let's let's just jump here. So in our next document that we're going to go over here in the COINTEL Pro here uh, is this quote. And this quote is, is of course, and uh, the reason why I ever, the first time I ever heard it, and as it's, it's actually highlighted here, which I didn't realize in, uh, in my uh, original looking at this article here. But the original quote is, uh, is quoted in the song Wake Up by Rage Against the Machine, but this is the original document, um, which is an, a memo regarding black nationalist groups, and they're labeled as hate groups, but that is not accurate. 
Um, and I'm going to read the actual uh, document. I will leave the visual here as I pull up the unredacted and um, full text that is actually easier for me to read rather than reading this over here. But it's for your sake. This is the original document pulled up here. Um, the article or the, sorry, the memo begins with the goals. So I'll start with the goals. So this is, this is going to be a couple minutes of me reading. So I apologize, but it will intersperse with me giving my takes on this, but this is important history for maximum effectiveness of the counterintelligence program. Again, also known as COINTELPRO, if I keep repeating that and to prevent wasted effort, long range goals are being set. One, prevent the coalition of militant black nationalist groups in unity there is strength, a truism that is no less valid for all triteness. An effective coalition of black nationalist groups might be the first step towards a real Mau Mau, black revolutionary army in America, the beginning of a true black revolution. Goal number two, to prevent the rise of a quote black messiah who could unify and electrify the militant black nationalist movement malcolm x might have been such a quote messiah he is the martyr of the movement today pause this is not me reading right now this is right after the death of malcolm x so important to note one of the quote black messiahs that they are talking about that could potentially rise up here it's already been, quote, neutralized. As we will get to, you will understand what I'm talking about. Martin Luther King, Stokely Carmichael, and Elijah Muhammad all aspire to this position. Elijah Muhammad is less of a threat because of his age. Elijah Muhammad is the leader of the Nation of Islam at the time. King could be a really uh, real, very real contender for this position. Should he abandon? This is very important. This is the most important piece of the whitewashing of Mal I mean of Martin Luther King Jr and the threat that he posed to the supposed uh white liberal order and I mean liberal as in what they're describing here so don't remember this is not liberal in today's lingo remember context matters King could be a very real contender for this position should he ab abandon his supposed quote, obedience to, quote, white liberal doctrines of nonviolence and embrace black nationalism. Carmichael has the necessary charisma to be a real threat in this way. So pause there. That is an extremely telling bit of, of context right there that, that should prick up every hair in the back of your neck thinking of and knowing that the FBI through the counterintelligence program sent threats and suicide letters or letters to Martin Luther King saying that he should commit suicide while he was in jail in Birmingham. This was a directed order from J. Edgar Hoover, the Attorney General of the United States. This is Martin Luther King. This is not some crazy person out in le like left field, like out of the blue, which it wouldn't be right then. But this is the person that we as Americans hold dear enough to have its own, his own holiday. Somebody that has, was so, again, revolutionary in their time, radical, for their time that he was assassinated and these people wanted to have him commit suicide. Sorry, I'm about to sneeze. <laughs> so pull up back into goal number four. To prevent militant black nationalist groups and leaders from gaining respectability by discrediting them to three separate segments of the community. The goal of discrediting black nationalists must be handed tacitly in three ways. You must discredit those groups and individuals to first, the responsible Negro community. Second, they must be discredited to the white community, both the responsible community and to, quote, liberals who have vestiges of sympathy for militant black nationalists sympathy, simply because they are Negroes. 
Third, these groups must be discredited in the eyes of Negro radicals and followers of the movement. This last area requires entirely different tactics from the first two. Publicity about violent tendency tendencies and radical statements merely enhances black nationalists to the last group. It adds respectability in a different way. Now, what does that sound like? What does the label, and again, I guess it doesn't have the full uh, number five on here, but uh, I have number five on here. Um, it is very, very apparent that what they're trying to label here is black people creating the narrative of violence. Now, what does that sound like? What does that remind you of? The stereotype and the racial bigotry that has been slapped on and has continued to grow from this moment, from this time, it actually stems before this time, but has been extrapolated from this to today is absolutely astonishing. It, it, it should really drive everybody up a wall, but, um, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to, to really gripe with this. And five, the, the, we'll just go to the last goal. A final goal should be to prevent the long range growth of militant black organizations, especially young among youth Sp specific tasks, uh, tactics to prevent these groups from, uh, converting young people must be developed. Then there are specific targets lined out. Primary targets of the COINTEL program, uh, counterintelligence program, black nationalist hate groups should be the most violent and mo radical groups and their leaders. We should emphasize those leaders and the organizations that are nationwide in scope and are most capable of disrupting this country. These target member, these targets, members, and the followers of multiple, you'll, you could just go through, there's a big list. But specifically, there are lists of uh, people and on the list, specifically listed, Martin Luther King Jr. Now, Fred Hampton is not just specifically listed in this, but he is a target of this. And this quote right here is an extrapolation from this memo that says, through counterintelligence, it should be possible to pinpoint potential troublemakers and neutralize them. This is a direct quote from J. Edgar Hoover himself. So when we talk about this history, when we look at the overlooked radical, and I mean radical as in good in this sense, people that were pushing the needle, standing up for working class people, standing up for intersectional rights. The powers that be, meaning the attorney general of this country, meaning Richard Nixon at the time, because we give that guy a pass way too much. And I mean that genuinely because Richard Nixon opens the door for Ronald Reagan and Ronald Reagan, of course, as we've already discussed, leads the, leads the door open for George W. Bush and Donald Trump and whatever we're dealing with now, which is this, if not outright fascist, this near fascist Republican party that has been growing and brewing for decades. This is the type of bigotry that has seeped in over the history of this country. It has been overlooked. Most people don't know who Fred Hampton is. Again, I will emphasize. And for those who didn't, you can go back and listen to what I just showed the clips. There are other clips of him speaking. I wish, you know, there, there's some there's some things that I wish that there was more of. This guy was so threatening to the FBI, the Black Panther Party was destabilized because in Chicago was destabilized by his murder. They were so afraid of him that they murdered him in his bed at the age of 21 years old. Now, this is the point of why it's important to note other than it ties together with what we were talking about in the beginning of the show with working class building an intersectional working class political movement moving forward and that is an inherently progressive movement 
people of different colors, races, religions, sexes, genders, cultures. That is one piece of it. The second piece is that we as a society today, we as a progressive movement today, do not have the quote Messiah that they are talking about in this memo. We never did. We probably never will. People look to, to Bernie Sanders or AOC to be this leader. The way that they cannot stop a long-term working class progressive movement from succeeding is rather than being a dragon with one head is that we form this gigantic movement that forms as a hydra, a multi-head, you know, one with, and I'm of course using my fantasy, my love of fantasy here, one with hundreds and thousands of heads, meaning hundreds and thousands of leaders that step up in your local community, organize on the local level, the state level, running for federal office, making change happen. It happens together, not as individuals. We can never rely on one person moving the needle solely. Now, it takes these charismatic leaders like Fred Hampton, like Bernie Sanders to move the needle. It opens up and creates pathways for people to move forward and create the space for people behind them. But it is incumbent upon people like us to be that nail in that we are building and, you know, slowly cracking at the foundation of what is existing now so that we can build a new solid foundation of a progressive working class movement. 